it's really difficult to find great executives. Spear Consulting helps organizations find all-star executives and hire the right one using work psychology so you can serve more customers and grow your business. To get a free quote, go to spiritmco.com. Enjoy the show. All right. Well, welcome back to the Virtuous Heroes podcast. Excited to be able to have a powerhouse on the show today. He's a former television sports anchor for NBC and CBS, having interviewed uh, athletes like Muhammad Ali, Michael Jordan. He's got a master's in theology, a doctorate in divinity. He's been the president of Southeastern University since 2011. He's seen a 241% increase in growth under his leadership. Dang, Dr. Uh, Engel, how do you find time to sleep at night? Well, I'll tell you, life's exciting, and uh, I've and thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, it's always a great journey when you can come alongside people, no matter what you do. And of course, in my role right now, I have the privilege to come alongside a great generation of students that God is raising up because they're going to serve Christ, they're going to serve the church, they're going to serve the world. And yeah, so it's an exciting adventure, that's for sure. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, Dr. Ingo, will you uh, give us a little bit about, uh, just tell us your your leadership journey and how you got to the leadership position that you're in today? Yeah. Well, uh, first and foremost, now, you know, I've been in this role since, uh, as you mentioned, 2011, started in February 1. So I'm in my 11th year here at Southeastern University. But uh, when you go way back to the beginning, again, what's always been important to me is, um, and I was taught early on, of course, I was raised in a Christian home uh, and had a lot of great um, influence from my godly uh, parents as well as godly grandparents. But they instilled in my life the importance of all, always following a sense of what God wants for you, a sense of his will, a sense of his design in your life. So I've been always very careful to make sure that I posture myself to listen uh, to what he's doing in my life so that I can see the open doors. And uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, my first career, I've had actually three careers. Um, and, uh, and my first career was in television started when I was 18 years of age. Uh, I had just graduated from high school. Didn't really know for sure what I wanted to do, but I knew two things that God had put in my heart. I wanted to, I loved working with people. I loved ministry. I had been involved even in high school and in the local church and serving in, in a variety of uh, ministry ways. And then I also loved sports because, and, and broadcasting, because I had a chance to, uh, meet uh, uh, some people involved in sports. When I was in junior high, I, I happened to have the chance through my family to meet Al Albert, who was the voice of the Denver Nuggets. We lived in Denver for a very short time and had a chance to meet him. And uh, and out of that, I had this great passion then for broadcasting. And so two things that I knew that I'd love to do, but I just didn't know how that would work out. And so I decided uh, instead of just you know, not knowing for sure what I was going to do, I'd go to the local community college and I started my general education, but I did take a couple of classes that I felt interested in. And one of those was broadcast writing and the the news director of the local NBC happened to be the teacher, professor. And uh, so uh, he told me, hey, I can, I can get you on as an intern uh, at, at our, you know, newsroom. And what would you like to cover? I said, well, I love sports. So he signed me the sports anchor. I was there about four, three, four months. And uh, he, uh, the sports anchor took a, a job in San Francisco and I was just 18 and 18 year olds, you know, they think they know everything at that age. And uh, I thought, you know, I can do all of this. And I went into the news director who was my professor. I said, I can do this. And uh, would you give me a shot at the job? And he kind of laughed. He said, Ken, I, I, I do know your, you know, your work in the classroom. I've seen you. I, you know what? I'll give you an opportunity. You can produce a sports show right here on our set. And uh, sure enough, I did. And, and he hired me and so I actually started anchoring the weekend sports uh, uh, for NBC in Bakersfield at the age of 18. Yeah. And then for the next 10 years, finally ending up in Los Angeles uh, uh, doing television sports. I thought that was where God would have me for the rest of my life and uh, loved it. And also along that journey, stayed involved in the local church and served in a variety of ways. But through a catalytic um, circumstance in my life, because often God does that, God will put um, he'll allow circumstances or, or he'll allow things that you go through to to speak to you. Um, and it was through um, 
a, a, a tragic situation in our family. My sister and her husband were youth pastors and they had just dropped their uh, kids off, uh, their youth group off from a, an outing and they were heading home and a drunk driver hit, hit them head on and, and they were both killed. Out of that, God just spoke to me about the importance of ministry and the power of ministry uh, and the power of influencing lives for the kingdom's sake. And out of that, I just felt God call me into to ministry. And, and so we began to plant a, a, a church in Northwest Los Angeles, um, put together a team and started pastoring that church and stayed as the, my wife and I stayed as lead pastors for 10 years uh, there. And so that started my pastoral career. And then we were there 10 years and then God opened another door for us to go to a ministry in Chicago to serve as lead pastors there. And so we went there. So uh, we were about 15 years in pastoral ministry and it was at Chicago when I received a call from the president, Don uh, Argue, Dr. Argue from Northwest University, said, Kent, we have, uh, we've watched your life in ministry. We love, uh, and by the way, and, and maybe we can talk about this in this podcast, but, you know, God always gifts people with with um, certain gifts and abilities and passions and experiences. And one of the things that he always put in my pathway was to lead turnaround opportunities, to take things that were dying or plateauing and have the ability to create growth and to create health. And he said, uh, you know what? We want to redesign our College of Theology at Northwest University. What you have done with the local church, we want to see that happen with the curriculum that we design and how we empower students. And would you consider praying about coming and being our brand new dean of our College of Theology and and ministry? And that was a tough decision because I love the local church and being a pastor and working with 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 the, those in 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 my care that God placed there. Um, but I thought, wow, what a privilege to exponentially affect the kingdom of God when you're coming alongside in, in a context like that, that uh, a college that is preparing students to serve in full-time ministry, uh, they're going to go out and, and literally um, be in churches all across the world. So I thought, wow, God, what an opportunity that you would give me. And so we made the decision to go there and uh, I served uh, at Northwest University there for uh, many years. And then uh, out of the blue, got a call from the search committee uh, here at Southeastern University. And they said, you know what, we're looking for a new president. Uh, uh, they had actually gone two years without a president. Uh, they said, uh, we have kind of hit a plateau. And once again, those were words that I love to hear because that's what I love doing. And uh, and they said, would you pray about coming to uh, Southeastern? And so uh, we did, and and lo and behold, we came, and, and and now we've been here 11 years, and we've seen, again, a great growth curve and turnaround, and, and it's just been a privilege. So I look back over my journey, and again, I've always believed God divinely designs our pathway, um, and, uh, and as Proverbs 3, 5 always says, if you trust Him, if you lean on Him, and not your own understanding, and you acknowledge Him, He'll always direct your paths. So uh, I believe he's done that and he's opened the doors. And as long as I am faithful to him and trust him and lean on him, you know, I'm going to be in the right seat. I'm going to be in the right position because God will, will make sure of that. And, and so that's currently where I'm at and uh, love serving, uh, serving this great institution. Yeah, I wanted to, first of all, thank you for uh, your candor and being able to share your journey. That's very inspiring. Um, and then the second thing is that was coming to mind is, you know, about uh, your, your, uh, I think you said your sister and, and your brother-in-law or was it the other yeah, way? Yeah. My, my sister and, and her husband. Uh, yeah. Um, were, uh, yeah. I shared that story. Yeah. So with, with your sister and your brother-in-law having passed away, um, just what you said is actually kind of like what <laughs> God has been speaking on to me in this season about just like how to not get too sucked into the suffering without recognizing like that there's an, like, like oftentimes our sufferings can be levels of promotion. We just have to, we just have to like not get too kind of like, depressed not get too frustrated with it and like kind of just like be focused on like the valley instead of just you know continually keep taking those steps as you're walking through the those valleys is there any um kind of 
uh, I guess, tips that you have for our listeners about like if, if our listeners are presently in a valley, how to like recognize when you're starting to get into like the stinking thinking and instead to, you know, be filled with hope and be looking yeah. for the way that God is working in your life at that time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, what's always been important to me is the issue of self-awareness and and self-management. And I've always believed, you know, that as we do life day by day, we have to position ourselves in a way to always be aware of what's going on. So when I look at self-awareness, um, I, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, constantly, what does God want to say to me? What is God doing in my life? And how I, how I discover that is I look at circumstances that I'm going through. And I do this actually on a daily basis. So at the end of the day, I'll, I'll look back at the day and reflect, okay, God, what did you teach me today? What did I learn? Who were the people I came into contact with? What were the conversations? What were the circumstances that happened? What were the challenges? What were the, the difficult things? And, and then, and one of the best ways I do is reflect, I write, it helps me in my reflection and something about that begins to unlock, uh, for me, what God may be speaking to me about. And I think if you always position yourself in the midst of whatever you're facing, whether that's a a difficult, tragic situation like was with my, um, with my sister and brother-in-law, um, or, or whatever it may be you're going through, if you will look to God who knows again, what's best for your life and say, God, even through this horrific moment, and you're going to be, you're human, you're going to have those e- human emotions, um, and, and it's going to be tough. But if you, by faith, stay in tune with what God can speak to you about in those moments, it's amazing to see what God does do. Um, I think where if if we start to reject or we become bitter or we turn away, we may lose out on some of the greatest opportunities God has for us. So to me, it's a position of your heart, a position of your mind. Um, you know, it's, it's, I go back to when, when Jesus says, love me with all your heart, soul, mind, your, your body. I mean, it's that holistic, um, positioning of yourself to make sure that you know exactly what God wants in your life. So I, I do that and self-awareness allows me, I look at, I look at my gifts. I look at my, um, experience is good, bad, difficult. I look at, you know, um, uh, what kinds of opportunities he has opened up for me. All of that helps me to know um, how to navigate what is in front of me and uh, make the right choices. So th- those are the things that I use. And then, of course, your, se- your self-management is is your discipline in your spirituality, your discipline in your physical, uh, mental, you know, spirit, all of those things holistically, as long as you're developing those and you're growing in those, I don't see how you can miss out on what God may have for you. It's when you when you fall off, you know, those issues. And, and quite honestly, early on in life, um, I, I struggled with uh, holistic development as it relates to physical, um, uh, you know, my physical body. I, um, I got so caught up in, in my work and all of that, I neglected the development of that, the discipline of that. And, and I had a, a, a major awakening in my life uh, where I went in for a routine, you know, blood work and, and uh, physical. And the doctor came back and said, man, you, you, your sugar count is almost 400, which is, if you know anything about that, that's extremely high and said, you are type two diabetic. And if you don't dramatically change the way you're doing life, it's, it's going to kill you. So I had to, uh, from that day on, had to begin to be disciplined and thank God I caught it early enough that I didn't have to, um, start taking insulin on a daily basis, but <clears throat> through some of the medication they were able to provide and through physical, um, you know, uh, training and, and working out and, and then the right kind of diet, I was able to control it. And my, uh, my sugar counts, my last counts were normal. And, uh, you know, God's been faithful to me in that area, but it required me to wake up and be disciplined in that. And, and so that's why self-awareness and self-management are so important. I, um, yeah, I think <coughs> what was resonating for me is, uh, you know, I've been doing a, a, uh, a nightly examination of conscience around like, you know, why should I be grateful for today, God, you know, 
where did I see you today? Where was I the best version of myself? Where was I the worst version? And then starting to pray through some of the <laughs> worst version stuff. Sure. And also teaching my children, they're nine and seven years old, two boys. It's just really like teaching the prophetic through that instead of just like, okay, God, I want to talk to you about where I was the best version of myself instead of like, God, show me where I was the best version of myself and teaching them just to like wait patiently and quietly until you hear that little voice speak to you and recognizing God's voice in your life. But, you know, I think the thing that you're really inspiring me here on Kent is just the journaling piece of that because yes. you know a lot of that is just in my own mind uh, in prayer instead of like actually taking some time to do some more like deeper reflections on that and, and I'm sure that's also kind of led to a lot of the different publications like having a, a discipline and self-management there of around being able to constantly be kind of like journaling in that way I'm sure has also like increased your ability to write and process in that way which has led to the massive library of publications that you've done to this point so you know for our listeners that don't know Kent has uh, four books up on his website kentingle.com the the framework leadership podcast and a blog just curious uh, Kent as to what what is your favorite publication and why Oh, that's hard. It's like asking uh, which child is your favorite child. You know, <laughs> you, you love them all, um, and uh, you know. But but I think probably the most foundational book for me is Framework Leadership. Um, you know, uh, I again have a framing process to approach um, everything I do in life, and the framing process is four simple things. First thing is listening, um, especially when you. When I look at my role uh, in an organization as a leader, whether that's being a pastor or whether that's being a president, um, uh, you know, I look at uh, listening. You can't, you know, one of uh, one of the principles that I uh, have always followed uh, that was taught to me is this principle that you can never know the potential of an organization um, uh, until you know the potential of the people. And how can you know the potential of the people until you take time to listen? How can you truly discover what, you know, God has you, how can you truly discover vision? How can you truly discover where we need to go until you take the time to get to know, um, especially the people, because by the way, everything that's done in life, uh, God has chosen to do it by, with, and through people. Um, and so people are the key. When you listen to people and you understand them, then it helps you to begin to create, to, to guide, to develop, to, uh, to have fresh vision uh, for what's happening. And I always, uh, I always tell the story when I, when I came here to uh, Southeastern, uh, they introduced me as the candidate to be president. And of course, they had me meet with all the different constituency groups of the university and, you know, from faculty to staff to students to uh, donors to alumni and 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 every single group. You can guess what the first question is They're They're asking me. They're asking me, OK, what's your vision for our university? And I'll never forget each time the way I answered to watch their faces. But I said, you know what? I don't have a vision. And they looked at me like, well, I, I, you know, I could tell some of them go, well, you're not going to be our president. You're not going to be our, <laughs> our pastor or All right, uh, next candidate. You know, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for your time. But uh, no, I, I said, how can I until I take time to spend spend time with you and to listen to you and to know what's on your hearts and and, you know, know what God has done here in the past and how can we build on that and how can we celebrate that and. And uh, and then begin to because, you know, what sets places apart, what sets, you know, uh, churches apart and, and universities, especially Christian universities, we all have some of this. We have the same mission, but we're all unique. Why? Because of the people that are there, who mm -hmm. they are, their gifts, their abilities, their talents, their experiences. So we can take if we take the time to listen. And so that's the number one thing in my framing process. The second thing is auditing the context. You've got to take time to thoroughly understand what's going on in a circumstance. What are the challenges? You know, what are the um, uh, difficult things? What are the great things? Uh, you know, what are the financial issues? I mean, you look at the full context, really discovering everything you need to know. So, for example, I remember um, uh, when when I went into Northwest Los Angeles, we put together a team to to grow and develop this this new church. 
uh, we, one of the things we did to audit the context was we did a what we call a value survey of the community. What does this community really value? And by discovering those values, it allowed us then to begin to build a church that would take scripture, take uh, the foundations of what faith is all about, and connect those to the values. So family was a strong value in that community. And so obviously the scripture talks about how important the family is. And so we're able to begin to build a ministry, build programming that would absolutely hit the issues and the needs that were so important to the people of that community and do it in, in the biblical, um, you know, godly way that, that God would want us to raise up people and empower people. So auditing the context is always important. You have to discover that. And, and again, you're going to, you're going to also know that these framing things, are constant. You know, you don't just do it one time. You are constantly doing this so that you again can make sure you you are where you need to go. Uh, the third component is what I call um, clarification. And that involves communication where you're constantly, this is what I'm hearing. I want you to tell me what you're hearing from me. I want, you know, it's this feedback loop and you're clarifying what's going on so everybody can be on the same page and you can grow together and you can be empowered together. So that's huge. And then the final thing of, a, of my framing process that I've always used is what I call a visionary alignment. When everybody knows and we're all on the same page and everybody knows who they are in the midst of the organization and their role and their calling, then everybody seems to flow together seamlessly. And one of the great examples, and I write about it in, in, in framework leadership, when I, when I was a television anchor and I worked in Los Angeles, I was able to cover the Showtime Lakers back in the uh, 80s. And that was with Magic Johnson. In fact, I think they're actually doing a HBO series on, on the, on the Showtime Lakers right now and haven't had a chance to watch it, but because I lived there and was with them. I'm going to see how accurate they are, are portraying them. But, but, you know, I had, I spent a lot of time with them and, and I saw how they worked hard. They were in the gym like at five in the morning and go late at night and they would work on fundamentals and they'd work on plays. But when they got out to execute in the game, it flowed seamlessly because there was alignment. Mm -hmm. And when you have listened and you have audited the context and you have clarified, then you can align yourselves to accomplish what it is you need to accomplish. And, and so I, I do that, you know, I do that on a personal level every day and I do that on a, on an organizational level. And so that's why that book is so important to me because that's foundational to how I do life. Um, and then, uh, and the other books also talk about the same things that, uh, helped me in my journey. Uh, the, the nine disciplines of, of leadership focus on, I think the disciplines like self-awareness, self-management, the discipline of generosity. I mean, there's just so many disciplines that I think help us to be what God wants us to be, uh, in the calling that he's placed upon our lives. And, uh, and then I talk about the adventure in life. Uh, that's another book. And then I wrote a book. My most recent one is to help college students and parents navigate the issues in higher education today, accessibility, affordability, experiential education. How can I know, how can I fulfill God's calling on my life? How can I be a good steward of that call with education? Because I believe that that's what God calls us to do. God's given you a life. He's designed that life. Um, you know, in fact, Psalm 139 says, before you took your first breath, he designed every day of your life. Mm. So he wants you to connect to his design. He wants you to connect to that. And so when you are, when you are knowing how to do that, then you can fulfill the destiny that he has for you. So all those books kind of focus on those issues that I've used in my life to, uh, to uh, serve God to the best of my ability and the calling that he's placed upon me. Have you been feeling unfulfilled? You want to be happy, but just continue to struggle. One of the best ways to experience joy is by caring for the homeless. A charity I've grown to love, River of Light, food rescues a million meals per year for the needy in Chicago. Imagine how that make you feel, knowing that you're helping feed children and veterans. To make a tax-deductible donation, visit riverlightchicago.org. Again, riverlightchicago.org. No one should go to bed hungry. 
Well, I love it. And uh, I mean, you're just absolutely uh, breathing fire, which I, fire of the Holy Spirit. Well, I love that. And the wisdom that God has poured out on you, Kent, is so, also so inspirational. And yeah, a lot to chew on there um, with both the framework leadership and the nine disciplines. And it sounds like just like for a lot of people that are looking to kind of raise their, their level of living, I think that these are great resources for being able to do that. So, so thank you for sharing in that way. You know, Kent, the, uh, the mission of this podcast is to inspire virtuous leadership, having seen, uh, you know, uh, kind of like the exact opposite of that that's created kind of the war in Ukraine right now, the Black Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement, and just, you know, a lot of areas of our culture where, uh, you know, toxicity and leadership is, you know, is really starting to, I guess, open people's hearts for, to, have leaders that come in that lead genuinely and want to inspire them to become their best selves in everything that they do. Before we can really dive into on the virtue side, though, I wanted to kind of talk about like just being able to connect um, with with our listeners as well. Because like if we just come out of the gates and and uh, you know talk about you know the 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 model wife and the Maserati and the big house oh, sure. like you know people that are are sitting in the gutters like I just got to figure out how to make my rent for this next month it's it's hard to kind of like relate in that way just curious because I know that we all have our own struggles and and journeys in that way I, you had shared one of them about you know having a you know your own sister pass away in a tragic accident but are there any vices that you've had to overcome to be the leader that you are today. Yeah, and, and and you know mentioning that which was a catalyst to uh, to navigate change in my life to listen to God, um, you know, and, and then I mentioned the story of of diabetes and and hmm. it, it affected you know my discipline and being holistic. I mean that definitely is a, a vice that I had to overcome there and to make sure that everything in my life is is um, on track the way God would want it to be. Um, and so, you know, that's always been an issue for me to make sure from a discipline standpoint that I am disciplining my life holistically to be healthy. Um, what I have discovered in um, leadership, you can grow an organization, you can grow um, uh, you know, the events or the circumstances, but sometimes may not be healthy growth. Hmm. Um, you know, it, it, you've got to be making sure that both of those elements are in check. And that's why I believe holistic health is, is very important in the way you grow your life. Um, question that I always ask God to help me with is, is this, how do I build a, a map in my life to a place where I need to go, where you want me to go. Um, help me to build that map uh, in, in, in the right way because part of growth and health is always knowing that God has a destiny for you, has a destination. And um, it's, it's constantly going to change because God will change how he wants to use you depending on what's going on in the world and the circumstances and the environment. So that has been you know, an issue that I've had to make sure that I stay in tune with a lot. I think another uh, area um, that I kind of struggled with early on is is the issue of feeling adequate enough. Am I doing everything I can? Am I am I um, am I excellent at what I'm doing? And I would struggle, you know, whether or not I'm I'm doing everything I could do in my role or my circumstance at times, and and I worked on this by becoming more self-aware again of calling, of how God wired me, and and to me, um, early on, that's where I I begin to realize the importance of taking time to look at. Uh, circumstances that I am going through to look at the people that God has placed in my life. What are they saying? What kind of encouragement am I receiving? Because all of those, um, I think, help guide me in the midst of whatever I'm facing and going through, whether that's a good experience, a difficult experience. And, and so 
you know, and also being, um, I'm a driven person. Um, and, you know, also realizing that I don't have to, another area is I don't have to do it all. I don't have to be the leader that's always in the front of the room. I don't always have to be the smartest voice in the room. You know, if I'm, again, go back to that self-aware of who I am and how God has made me and how he's created me and the gifts and the abilities and talents that he's given me, then I'm able to, uh, to step into that circumstance, recognizing who has the gift or who has the leadership for that moment that you know, I need to empower and I need to encourage to step up and, and take that role. So that's always been important to me. Um, you know, learning how to let others that I have the privilege to work with lead and grow and recognize their unique, uh, uh, gifts and abilities and, and temperament. So those are some of the things that I think have always been, you know, challenging that I have to keep check, you know, check on, um, you know, constantly, you know, praying that prayer, God search me, you know, help me to, to know the things that I need to, to change, to grow, to develop. Uh, and that's all a part of that self-awareness process. That's all a part of that, um, self-management process. That's so important to me, um, in terms of discipline. Yeah. Well, that's, that's awesome. Um, yeah, that really resonates with me because, uh, actually, it was in church in 2015 that I, you know, heard the prayer: "God, search me, break me, guide me, yeah. lead me, and use me in a, in alignment with uh, the life of Saint Joseph." And yeah. after praying that for two weeks, God gave me this vision for this uh, ministry called Catholic Sports Camps, and and uh, we we went off and started to build that. But what became evident through that journey is that you know exactly what you said of like wow i've got a lot of issues with with like interpersonal things that is going on with christopher that i need to work on in order to you know grow as a leader to be able to you know keep on progressing within within uh, god's design for my life so so that that's beautiful and thank you for sharing in that way what about on the opposite side of that kent about you know certain virtues that you feel like you've been able to grip on to more naturally that, that haven't been as, as much of a hurdle? Well, you know, I've always, uh, and I think I've said this already, but I love people. So I've always been others oriented. Mm -hmm. And if somebody ever asks me, um, what's your mission? Because, you know, uh, everybody wants a personal mission statement and, you know, organizations, you know, they have their mission. What would be mine? And, and I've always said, it's just two words. It's others oriented. That's the way God has wired me. I just love to come alongside people and celebrate who they are and, and empower them. Um, and those, those things are, are extremely important in, in, in the way that I serve. Um, that's what helps me to be the godly leader that I believe God wants me to be. I think the other thing that I've learned in terms of helping me to, you know, be in, in what you're saying, a, a virtuous leader, if you will, is I've always believed there's not an issue. There's not a problem. There's not a conflict that we don't face on a day by day basis that the fruit of the spirit doesn't bring the remedy. So when you, when you look at the fruit of the spirit, and I believe that's the way God designed us to be, all of us to be, um, especially in leadership, you know, to be, uh, loving, to be kind, to be filled with joy, to be patient. Um, you know, those are the things that allow you to have true impact, um, in people's lives, um, in, in kingdom development, um, in organizational life. Um, so if I'm always approaching everything, okay, when I think about the fruit of the spirit, what do I need to do? And I, and I'm constantly praying God, um, the number one thing I want to be able to do is to discern every moment of the day. So if I can discern the moment, then I can apply the right gift of the spirit. I can apply the right fruit of the spirit. And I, be, I can begin to see what God can do in the midst of that circumstance. Sometimes that's just, you know, an encouragement. Sometimes that's an admonishment and a challenge for 
for, uh, you know, what's going on. But, but I, I just want to be able to do that. Um, a lot of people call that, um, in, in organizational life, uh, emotional intelligence, um, you know, but I call it spiritual discernment that God gives you the ability to walk into a room and begin to discern the dynamics so that you can speak kingdom life into the issue or the circumstance or the challenge. So those are things that I've worked hard to, I don't want to say master, but, but to be excellent at that, to strive for that. Um, and I have seen every time that I, I live by that great, great things happen in the midst of the circumstance. And I see kingdom life happen and I see people be changed and transformed. Um, you know, and, and if you, when you go back and you, you know, I, I love to read the Psalms and the Proverbs over and over and over again, because you talk about two great books that really influence day-to-day life. If you look at those books and read it with the lens of what Jesus taught about the fruit of the Spirit, Mm -hmm. you will see much of the wisdom that is shared um, is relying on the fruit of the Spirit. Um, you know, uh, so it's, to me, those are the things that help me to be the kind of leader that will, will have kingdom influence and kingdom impact. And that's what I strive for. So Ken, what you're ultimately saying there is that like, if you look at, if you're reading the Psalms and Proverbs through the lens of that, you need the foundation of the fruits of the spirit of what Jesus had endowed into us through the Holy Spirit, that that's the way, if you can look at it through that lens, those are the, the, the cornerstone and foundational pieces to actually be able to like take those, those uh, disciplines and wisdoms and, and actually bring them into the world. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So um, yeah. So to launch into prayer, Kent, uh, what's the biggest challenge that you have in your life right now? I'd love to pray for it on the show. And, and then when God delivers upon it, the, to give us the testimonial of that. But then also uh, after I get done praying, if you could then pray for our audience to also be able to have the, you know, anyone listening today to have the ability to overcome the vices that you've overcome, uh, yeah. which ultimately first requires us to even recognize those in our lives. And then also to, you know, be able to, you know, impart the virtues that you've been gifted with too. Yeah, I think uh, I think a great prayer request that, um, you know, I'm constantly asking people to pray with me about is is the role that I have here at this university. You know, um, I have the privilege to lead a university that is coming alongside students, helping them to discover, as as I've shared, their divine design so that they uh, can be empowered by God's spirit to uh, serve in their life and their learning and their leadership. Um, but that always involves discerning truth. Um, and if we, if there's anything we're living in today, it's a crisis of truth um, and wanting to be able to have it. But here's the, here's the thing. Truth is relational. You say, what do you mean? Truth is relational. Truth is relational because Jesus is truth. And you can have a living relationship with truth because he said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And you can actually go, uh, that's recorded in John. You can go a a few verses, uh, a few chapters later. um, And it talks about, uh, he had a conversation with Pontius Pilate. And it's a question that's being asked today by a lot of students and young people. What is truth? Mm -hmm. And that's what Pontius Pilate asked Jesus. Well, what is truth? And Jesus said, I was born into this world so that you could witness truth. You could see truth in the flesh. Mm -hmm. And then he said, and those who obey my voice, those who long for truth will obey my voice and follow me. So my prayer is to always be on guard making sure that I am discerning truth, but discerning Jesus in the way I need to, but also to help these amazing students to, in a world that, where they say they're, you know, 
uh, truth is whatever you want it to be. Um, you know, I want them to know there is absolute truth and it is in Jesus Christ. And so that would be the prayer that I always ask uh, people to help me make sure that I'm strong in that. Um, awesome. Yeah. Well, Lord Jesus Christ, we, uh, we give you this meeting again and uh, we love you, Lord. I uh, love you so much and uh, appreciate this uh, holy man of God that uh, is coming into my sphere and being able to impart his wisdom, both for the podcast, but also, Lord, for me selfishly of being able to have just, uh, you know, many different mentors that uh, are helping to, you know, share their wisdom to help me grow as a leader as well. And Lord, I just pray that you continue to pour out your your truth and wisdom, that you are the truth, the way. Lord, that you 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 provide the way to everlasting life, both bringing heaven down to earth here, as it is in heaven. And so, Lord, I just pray that you continue to open up the treasury of heaven and and pour out more of your grace and blessings. That that people even listening to this episode, Lord, I can see people that are just having revelation right now, being born again being moved in the spirit, experiencing your love, God. And I thank you, Father, for endowing these gifts. And uh, as your beloved disciples, being able to, through your stripes, be able to you know, hear the word of God, be able to heal and, and deliver people from evil spirits, Lord, that, that Lord, that thank you so much for the gifting of discernment of spirits so that we can continually to be able to discern what's not from you and help people to be set free from it. And that, Lord, that that you just, whatever giftings that you've given me in, in healing and the prophetic and discernment of spirits, Lord, that I just pass them to, to Kent as he continues on his journey in this season. And, uh, yeah, Kent, if you could uh, close us in prayer, that'd be awesome. Father, we thank you. Uh for who you are and what you mean to us. We're grateful that uh, Jesus gave his life for us and that we can have relationship. Uh, and and we're, we're, we're thrilled for the privilege to be able to grow in the destiny that you have for each and every one of us. And may we know without a doubt what Ephesians 2.10 says, that we are your masterpiece, every single one of us, a masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which you planned long ago. Uh, Lord, you have a plan for our lives, and may we realize that deep in our soul, that you want to guide us and lead us in on a life that's filled with abundance. Um, and you've come to give us a life uh, of abundance. And that's what you declare in John 10.10. 10. So I pray that we will realize who we are in Christ Jesus. I also realize, God, that, you know, in this world, we we can easily, the enemy wants us to lean on ourselves or lean on everybody else but God. And I pray that you will help us to trust in you. And that's why Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 are so important. Trust in the Lord with all of our heart, not lean on our understanding, but acknowledge you and you will direct our paths. And I pray that you will help all of us to do just that. And also in this world where also John 10, 10 says the thief wants to come in, the enemy, the devil wants to come in, rob, kill, and destroy, but you've come to give us life. I pray that you'd help us to realize that greater that he is he that's in us than he that's in the world. When we have Christ in our lives, we can overcome. And I pray that you will help us to do so. And that's why I love Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, where he says to all of us about our relationship with God. He says, stand firm in the faith. Uh, he says, always be on guard, be strong, be courageous, and do everything with love. And I pray, God, that you'll help us to do those things. And if we do those things, wow, what a difference we can make for your kingdom's sake. So we submit these to you. And again, know that you will lead and guide us in a divine way. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, Kent, as you were just uh, closing us out in prayer, the image that I was getting was that of, of an eagle. And I feel like even before when you were speaking, I felt like the Lord was speaking to me about the fivefold ministry and how clearly you're an apostle within that, you know, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. But as an apostle, one of the, the gifts there, I guess, as you were speaking about this is 
one of the core gifts of the apostle is in governance, but also being able to recognize people's gifts and be, you know, as you're going off planting churches, having the ability to recognize those gifts, to put those people in powers, in positions of power, which clearly the Lord has anointed you in. And then the other thing about the eagle, um, just being able to just see the strength that you have in the Lord, but also like an eagle is known for their vision. Uh, and that the way that the Lord has blessed you with vision um, to be able to see, you know, into the heavenlies and bring that down to earth of what God's already doing and partnering with God in that way. And then lastly, you know, one of the things that, you know, that even even in uh, all of the images that we have for America is the eagle trampling upon the serpent and uh, just the way that that you, uh, Kent, by, by, you know, following Jesus and staying close to him with the intimacy that you have, that you've been able to destroy the works of the devil for your territory. And so, yeah, I just, I bless you with that. And uh, I can't so thank much. you enough for uh, being on the podcast today where we inspire virtuous leadership. And uh, yeah, many blessings to you. Well, thank you. I've thoroughly enjoyed our time together, Christopher. So thank you for uh, the invitation. Hey, Chris here. Hope you enjoyed the episode where we discussed all things going bald. <laughs> Just joking. If you enjoyed the episode and the podcast, will you please subscribe on YouTube or Apple Podcasts or Spotify? Or you could also share it with a friend. That would be tubular. I hope you have an awesome day.